Ms. Evangeli, have a good day, I think, for Italians in general and for all of us sitting here. And uh, this is an event to organize the celebration of Adam Toon's um, great masterpiece that just came out with this mindless metaphor, a defense of natural fictionalism. You see it here, you see it here, everybody has a copy. If you have a copy, you will be able to buy one as soon as you <laughs> run out of the room at the end of this session. Uh, but it is wonderful to see Adam has been, of course, one of our pillars in our community for many years now. I remember very well as a meeting in Geneva. I didn't want to yes. think about when that was, yeah. which year, it was many years ago. Um, when I just arrived in Exeter and Adam was thinking about what to do mm -hmm. uh, in life more generally, and, uh, and I was thinking, gosh, what a great person, he's doing this fantastic work on modeling, fabulous, fabulous. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, a couple of years later, he was here and having brought some um, really prestigious Marie Turin uh, grant uh, to do wonderful work already starting to, you know, mm -hmm. you could see this kind of work on the horizon of fictionalism, but uh, not, well, quite, yeah, not well. quite clearly at that point, uh, but it's been wonderful, I think, for all of us here who's been in Esther for a bit longer to see Adam's career and thinking and vision develop and, and do it very much at the heart of our community here. So this is a very, very happy event for us. And the way this is going to run is we're going to have Adam providing a quick introduction to his book at the beginning. And then we're incredibly honored to have Dan Hato, who has made his way all the way here to be present today and to be our star guest today. And Dan is really one of the world leading philosophers working on an activism and embodied cognition. And so it's just a fantastic thing uh, that you could come, Dan. Thank you for this and uh, provide some comments and insights and maybe a few critiques even, yeah. like what I did anyhow. In person, we have to have as a second act of today's uh, conversation. So down the the floor, after which Adam will be allowed to provide just a few remarks okay. <laughs> as a response. And then of course we'll open it up and um, very much invite discussion, follow-ups, comments, congratulations, anything you want to offer. After all of this, you'll be all very much invited to uh, come out to the foyer and we're gonna have drinks and we're gonna have a few snacks and hopefully we're still gonna be able to be outside too, unless it starts being uh, no, really no. badly. Uh, but <laughs> we, we, we'll get to this in a little while. Now, Thank you. Thank you very much, Sabina. And, and, and I wanted to start by thanking Sabina for, for um, supporting this event and, and making it, it happen. Um, and also, so Sabina says, I think it's, it's 10 years um, almost almost to the day since I, I came to, to Exeter. And, and Sabina, through that time, has given me countless uh, pet talks and support, uh, especially during writing. I think um, you know lots of us will know that um, one of the Really remarkable things, special things about Sabina is that even though you're supposed to be in three places at once most of the time, she's always got time for us if we, we get in touch to have a chat. And, and, and I'm really, really grateful to for all of that. Um, and, and thanks all to you for, for coming. And it's a busy time and, uh, of year. Um, uh, and, um, you know, thank you to, to all of you that um, have listened to me um, bang on about some of this stuff for. for um, you know, the past few few years, longer than I, I care to remember. Thanks especially to, to Adrian for organising a reading group on the book, um, and and to all of you who came to that. And and if, um, I feel very lucky to be in a place with such a lot of clever and well-informed people, but also people who are um, always generous with their time and and supportive of their, their criticism and so on. And, um, and uh, I'm I'm really great, uh, glad that you can all come and you can have a glass of wine after. Um, uh, Dan's giving us comments. Thank you also to Dan for, for coming. So, when Sabina said that we'd be able to invite someone here, Dan was right at the top of my list, but I didn't think we stood much chance of getting in here because you live rather a long way away and very busy. Um, so, so thank you for breaking what was already a long trip from Australia to the sub Arctic, yeah. a few miles out from sub Arctic, yeah, this, uh, uh, to, to come via Exeter on the way back. I'm, I'm really grateful to you for, um, for, for coming. Um, so I thought what I would, would do, because I haven't, believe it or not, there might be some of you in the room who I haven't uh, gone on about this stuff to at some point over the last, you know, five years or whatever. Um, so I thought I'd start just with a, a, a very quick um, kind of intro to the, the main guiding idea behind the book, and then um, and then I'll hand over to Dan for his, his comments and, and 
and quite obvious. And, um, so, um, yeah, I think that, I mean, the main question that the book's interested in is uh, um, uh, 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 the question of what, what is the mind? Um, and the approach that um, it takes to that is approach that's, that's familiar, of course, from lots of um, philosophy, which is to try to approach that question of what is the mind by um, thinking about our ordinary talk about the mind and how we want to make sense of that. And that um, is um, often called folk psychology in the in literature. So um, I won't mean anything too kind of loaded by that, but just the everyday facility that we all have and use much of the time without even thinking about it to attribute beliefs, desires, wants, needs, and um, uh, feelings and the rest of it to um, people that we, we meet. And of course, we're remarkably good at doing that, even to people that we, we don't know. So, you know, I, I walk into a bar and I stand there and um, I'm gesturing, trying to get someone's attention. And even if you know nothing about me, um, you'll probably infer that I want to drink and I think that you can get a drink at a bar if you've got money and so on. And you'll, you'll effortlessly attribute all sorts of states and um, make predictions like that if you push in front of me, I'll be annoyed and, and so on. So we're, we're fluidly um, attributing these states to people all the time. And the question is how how we ought to, to make sense of that. And, and sort of via that, giving a particular answer to that question, I want to in the book get into lots of related issues that follow from the, the basic approach you take um, to that central question, um, like the question of how our thoughts represent the world, um, what the relationship it is between mind and material and culture, um, and in the last chapter to try to come to where I actually started the, the whole thing, thinking about the role of material culture tools in scientific inquiry and how they, um, as a trudge, show, help allow us to think new thoughts. So, um, so I thought it might help just for, for those who um, aren't uh -huh. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm familiar with, with some of these debates to, to, to kind of outline probably a little bit uncharitably or quickly um, what is arguably still the, the dominant view on many of these questions, which is a, a, a take on what ordinary talk about the mind is, is doing, um, which is that roughly speaking, um, folk psychology is a kind of proto-scientific theory. Um, and that what we're doing when we talk about people's thoughts or their feelings or their wants and so on um, is giving a kind of rough and ready theory about their inner machinery. So, so the, the thought here is that folk psychology says, um, in you know, you we don't in this view we don't see people's beliefs and desires. What we see is their behaviour, but we infer that they have these um, hidden states, belief, desire that are animating their behavior in something like the way in which a physicist, say, um, infers the existence of electrons from the atoms on a cathode ray tube screen or what have you. So, um, so there's a, a, a kind of dominant view um, uh, that mind on this view, a kind of inner machinery that we infer to from people's behavior. And within that general picture, thoughts, by which I'm, I mean things like beliefs, desires, and also um, related states of people's understanding, so on, the reasoning, um, turn out to be um, inner representations of mental representations. So, you know, I, if I um, have a desire for ice cream, then I've got an inner representation that says, have an ice cream, um, and combined with the right beliefs, like the belief that the corner shop sells ice creams, it um, uh, gives my legs a shove and encourages me to go to the corner shop. Something, um, something like that. So, and, and this view, of course, um, gets filled out in, in lots of, of different ways. Um, uh, in um, its uh, original formulation, at least according to uh, some authors, um, we can use the term Cartesianism, of course it's debatable to what extent this captures all the subtleties of, of Descartes' own position, but on one um, view this inner machinery is not, it's not physical machinery, it's what Gilbert Rahr calls paramechanical, so it's a, um, it, a, a non-physical machinery. Um, but nowadays people often use this term neo-Cartesianism to mean a view that's roughly like Descartes, but that takes this inner machinery to be physical, usually located in the brain. But the structure of the view is very similar. The mind is a, an inner mechanism of some kind that lies behind that. 
And if you have that view, of course, if you think folk psychology is a, a kind of rudimentary theory, then it's very natural to ask, is it true? Right? In other words, so an awful lot of debate um, in the literature about um, uh, whether or not folk psychology, if indeed it is a theory, will be vindicated by future cognitive science. And roughly speaking, there are two ways you could go. You could say it is true or um, it isn't. So um, probably the, um, the most famous proponent of the, the first view, the view that folk psychology would be roughly speaking vindicated by columns of science is Jerry Fogel, um, and you know, can just say what this view of realism. Um, and you know, um, uh, Fogel and other people like him uh, are um, reasonably confident that. Um, the um, future of cognitive science will uncover things um, uh, that have the right kind of structure to serve as beliefs and desires um, in our cognitive machine. So the folk will turn out to be not entirely, but by and large right about the machine. At the other extreme, you've got people like Paul and Patricia Churchill who think that the folk will turn out to be wildly mistaken, that um, when we have a final cognitive science and neuroscience, what have you, the, the structures that it puts forward will look nothing like um, what um, uh, Churchill calls the, um, the linguistic structures, right? The, the sentential kinematics of folk theory. So we just won't find things like beliefs and desires in the brain. Instead, we'll find all these more complicated structures. And so, talk about beliefs, desires, thoughts, so I've got to go the same way as, as um, the church and consider um, belief in phlogiston, which is crystalline spheres. Just, just have to and that's, you know, so we're eliminating the mind. And so what I've been interested in, in doing, of course, um, there are lots of other views out there in the literature, what I've been interested in doing is, is giving a, a different way of reading our ordinary talk about mind, the folk psychology, which um, avoids that starting point that both the realist and, and the limitist get into. So that avoids the thought that what's really happening in folk psychology is um, that we're trying to make inferences about people's image. And instead, I, I've tried to um, I develop this idea that an awful lot of our talk about the mind is fundamentally metaphorical. And to kind of cash that out, I've been drawing on a particular theory of, of metaphor from the philosopher of art, um, Kendall Walton, who some of you will know, and drawn on his work in an early work on scientific models. And Walton gives this um, a lovely analysis of children's games and make believe and pretends and so on that he uses to try and understand representational art and fiction, but also uh, a lot of metaphor and figurative language. So the aim in the book is to take that machinery for understanding metaphorical language and apply it to our talk about the mind and see what, what view results from that. And, and, and the label that um, has been given to that view is mental fictionism. So roughly speaking, the thought is, if you take this lesson that a lot of our talk about the mind is, is metaphorical um, in a certain way, then this inner world of the mind that houses our thoughts, our beliefs, and desires, and so on, and turns out to be useful. Okay. Um, so, and so just one way to, to introduce that idea, here's a, a myth that's often used to um, uh, support the idea that um, uh, uh, folk psychology is a kind of theory. So this is due to the philosopher of Wilkin Sellers. And Sellers says, well, imagine there's a society that didn't have um, folk psychology, didn't have talk about um, so What they have is what he calls a rhyming language. In other words, a language that only refers to overt behavior. So they can say, Adam's arm went up, but not Adam wanted to ask a question, or Adam needed the toilet. So they, they can just talk about behavior of bodies. How could they get this con the concept of mind? Well, um, uh, Sellers is imagined as a visionary theorist who comes along called Jones. And Jones has this great idea where he says, well, you know, we can make sense of people by thinking that they have in their heads something a little bit like the sentences that they say out loud. Right? And so sometimes, you know, I say, I want to drink of water, and I pick up a bottle and have a drink of it. Other times I don't say anything out loud, I just pick up a bottle and drink. And Jones's great innovation is saying, you know, you can explain what Adam did when he just picked up a bottle of water and drank it by saying he had a desire to have a drink of water. And that's rather like um, what he, he said out loud, but it's just silent, it's, it's in his head. So, so that's one way of understanding this idea that folk psychology is a, is a theory. And, and the, the analysis of what to propose is uh, a kind of one way to put it is as a, a little variation on that myth. Right? So suppose that what um, 
And Jones introduces to this society is not a new theory about an inner world, but is a set of useful metaphors. Right. So, so think about the metaphor um, that Walton uses as an example of talking about a figurative language of talking about Italy as a boot. So I say, um, you say to me, where's where's the town of Cotone? For example, I said, oh, well, it's on the arch of the Italian boot. Right? And the thought is, well, what am I doing when I'm saying that? Well, I'm not saying there really is a giant boot floating in the Mediterranean. I'm just, I'm, I'm involved in a certain kind of pretense. But by doing that, I indicate where the town is in it. Right? Or, you know, I say someone's standing at a crossroads. And I'm not, um, if I'm speaking metaphorically, I'm not. Um, uh, making the assertion that they're, they're standing at a point where two roads depart, but I'm saying something like that makes an important decision. So, uh, so the thought here is we can understand what's introduced into a language, right? When we need to get folk psychology to talk about the mind by saying um, that it's a useful set of metaphors. Roughly speaking, we're saying people behave as if they had things in their heads a little bit like sentences, pictures, and so on that guide their day. And in, in Sellers' myth, the, the source for, for um, his, Jones' his theory of mind is um, a, a verse speech. Yeah. Um, and, but I want to say that when you, when you look at um, a, a lot of uh, talk about the mind, there's all sorts of other sources for metaphors. So we sometimes talk about memories, if it were kind of in a notebook, where we could write, store important information and act upon, and talk about desires as a kind of wish list that you can and tick off and so on. Um, and so the thought is that a lot of our talk about the mind is a kind of metaphorical projection of the whole world of material culture and language and the uses we make of it into an inner world of the, of the mind. Um, and that's enormously useful and we couldn't do without it, um, but we ought to be careful not to take it too seriously. So, so one of the, um, I can remember when I was asked what I was going to teach at, at Exeter, and I was John was my um, the scientist in charge. Uh, it's official title, my Mary Key project, scientist in charge. Um, we got into a lot of chat about the extended line thesis and how it was uh, uh, reminiscent of themes in the later Wittgenstein and Ryle, and I decided to teach a course on, on Ryle's concept of mind. And, and as many of you will know, Ryle is the, um, uh, the, the person who came up this phrase, the, the dogma of the ghost in the machine for Cartesianism. So the thought that we're, uh, we have a kind of little inner ghost somewhere, or not really anywhere, um, uh, that's driving our behaviour. And for Ryle, that's a, a mistake right, that Descartes or others introduce and then impose upon us as the folk. Right? So the, the, the folk, um, for Ryle or not, um, as it were, um, guilty of this confusion, um, but philosophers come along and impose this mistake on the folk thinking of Ryle as a you know, world, it's a category mistake in Ryle's terms. Um, and I think the, the view that I've tried to put forward is um, slightly different, that, that Ryle's right to say there is no inner grotto, as he calls it, but it's not just something that's imposed upon folk by philosophers, it's not just a mistake. So I say this, this way of thinking about mind is part of our language, but it's, um, it's metaphorical. So we need to avoid both the mistake of Cartesianism to taking it too seriously, but also the mistake of people like behaviorists thinking we can just do without those. Okay. So keep the ghost in the machine as a story, don't think there really is a ghost, uh, or that we can try and make it respectable by identifying it with the brain. On the other hand, I don't think you can just do the brain. Okay. I think that's it. Oh yes, there's a there's a uh, <laughs> yeah. to to know there's a cost of living crisis going on. Uh, so you know, only 42 pounds now. Oh, or that's available free so from the library. So okay, I've talked long enough. Let me hand over to you down. Okay. So, um, first of all, I just want to say thanks to all of you for having me over here uh, and also rescue me from the sub party of uh, Finland. But I wanted to say something as, you, uh, as a beginning. So, it's true actually on that trip and on other trips like late because I don't want to spread myself so thin. I haven't gone other places that were available. So, 
there is a reason that I chose to come here, and it actually is to do with Adam's work, and I think it's great work and really exciting stuff. So it's not an accident. I wouldn't have gone anywhere. There were a lot of other choices, and I was trying to go straight up. So this was an extra opportunity. Sorry. Yeah, no, no. And the other thing is, uh, I just to say, I think in the whole host of it, I think you guys must already know because you work with him. And also, I think one of the nicest people I've ever met in a being ever, right? I think there's only one other contender I know, and I work with Sean Gallagher, who's been you know, like the nicest of most ten person. Um, but I think you beat into the house. Adam, I'm not sure what you're saying. So you're not beating your exam work. Well, no, that's a post <laughs> I'm actually really excited by um, the entire work that he's been doing. And in fact, just to give another headline about that, now there's a conference that Thomas. Uh, uh, um, oh, yeah. Yeah. Timothy, uh, is organizing in Budapest. Um, and I agreed to come to that too, even though that's flipping insane. And you could literally fly from Australia and back again for that event. So, a second book launch for Adam's stuff, because I do think this is an exciting area in uh, that's been developing and uh, uh, working in parallel ways alongside it. So, that's the kind of opener. So, Adam, you did a great job of reverse reversing um, what you've done. So, I'm going to move through it now. I'm going to try to get down to brass tacks, which is a metaphor. Uh, and um, the thrusting of the discussion here is fictions, um, useful and otherwise. So the, the, the core or the punchline is going to be this. Adam's work is really exciting, but he tends to be very positive in relation to how useful the metaphors might be. And so one of the questions I want to press him on is, might there be different uses and maybe not all of them, or might some of these things be less than useful? Or indeed, uh, as I'll use the terminology, not useful, but pernicious mm -hmm. metaphors, right? So stuff that we get stuck in, that we need to get out of or away from. So this, I think on both sides, I think a different verdict of it. So I'll quickly reverse through some of what we've just heard. I'm just going to go flying past the bits where Adam already covered it, I think, in adequate detail in that introduction. So um, on metaphors of the mind, this was the 2016 expression of the position, which also comes up in the book. But I, I highlighted in green the first part, and this is, I think, going to be rather more important as we go along, is that ordinary talk about the mind involves acts of the tense within the game of make-believe. Why the ordinary? Because that's going to be more as you were stressing the folk psychological as you did there, and that fits with the Salazian myth that you just talked about. However, um, the question is, what happens when we move from just ordinary everyday uses to try to use some of the same material to, and this is what happens in other domains like cultural science. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. And that's already, you can see the headline, and you're beginning to worry that maybe, while it might be useful in one context, it may not be useful in all contexts. Okay. So as Adam puts it here, within this game, we are to imagine that people have certain inner states inside their heads, such as beliefs and desires. We are also to imagine that these states are arise in certain circumstances, interact in certain sorts of ways, do certain sorts of behavior. I'm going to bracket a little bit this when we come to the folk psychological too. I don't know how much, I think that I'm going to want to suggest that folk psychology is a game that we get into, that we're enculturated into. Um, and I think part of that can be a way of talking. I don't know whether that can, some of those metaphors might be edited down. Like, and I don't know how committed everyone has to be to the to the things actually being, as you put it here, uh, inner or moving or whatnot. So that's an interesting question. That takes you to the last comment about the Wiley and paramechanical. So it's, you know, just how much does our everyday folk really committed to that, or they're just a way of talking that they're very familiar with that gaming and, and learning a metaphor uh, or learning a game of make believe, if you like, about how to talk about it. I think I'm I'm very sold on, but. The question is, there could be a lot of interesting work to, to investigate how much of that is, is built into the everyday way of talking. Um, so mental fictionalism, or MF, holds that we can take folk psychological talk at least seriously, while also denying that it entails any fact stating, cause identifying ontological commitments. This is the 100% cake and eat it to position. If you're trying to go for that, right? And look at that, it looks like he's eating a sour cake here. Uh, but, um, uh, so, so there are precedents for this in the history of, of philosophy, and Dennis, Dennis resists being called a fictionalist per se, but I'm wondering if he protests too much um, on, on this. That's a longer discussion. Um, yes, there is the, um, the appeal to this whole uh, work uh, from Walton about the nature of make-believe 
uh, in art, in, in, in other domains. And as Adam's already talked us through this, I'm just going to kick on to his own example. Again, the, the, um, the locate, locating Crotone by using, pretending um, actively that the Italy is a boot so that you can navigate around that and find it. Uh, when someone touches Crotone, it's on the art of the Italian boot, the person is not making a straightforward search. Right? Such an option is active but hence, even so, by pretending in such a way, the person does make a genuine assertion, albeit indirectly. Namely, that the location of Crotone is such that it can be found on the arch of the boot. So treat it as a, uh, as a metaphor, and now you can locate, you can do something of interest and something that's useful. I think this is the core thought. And why I want to repeat it is because we're going to have to see how well that holds up in all cases, right? Something like this. So fictionally, he speaks the truth, as it were, in this case, and that's good outcome. So really, the, the, the question here is, if we can get away with that, why be so serious and get so hung up about this ontology? It kind of gives you your way out, right? I can, I can use the useful parts and I can throw away all the troublesome bits that we don't have good answers to. But the core part of um, Adam's uh, work is that each one of these why, not, why be so serious metaphors are always, I think you're like, you know, the fat controller. You think all of those engines are always useful. And if I recall from my own memories of Thomas the Tank, not all of those engines were always as useful as every other. Thomas was like an exception. Some of them were really pain in the arse engines. Uh, so that's where I'm headed. Um, here's another example to give you another case, which might be to, to head off where we might be going. And I think this is an interesting one in the discussion. We might go there because I think if you're trying to, if you buy the basic premise, this is where you might want to go to preserve the usefulness and I and I want to I want to flag it up because I think there's be problems with this particular maneuver. So so one is that you say the crowds over next to look angry. This is actually another one of your examples from the book, uh, and are darker than usual. Clouds are darker than usual because they are thicker and denser. They contain more water or ice crystals than usual. That's why they look like that. So thus we call them thunder crowds angry. We are thus in fact systematically tracking causally relevant properties connected with their likely behavior. So here's one way of being useful. Right? You take the metaphor not too seriously, but it systematically correlates with things that you know you want to have understand and connect to. Right now, that's a um, optimistic outcome. Like if it's always going to be like that, then you can think this is going to be great. But I'm going to suggest that in many cases, we should have be more pessimistic in our outlook of not just about the weather, but also about the cognitive science weather. So if that's the case, we might get into a situation where this is the, the good case for the metaphors being useful, and we might find that there are more naughty engines in the train yard yet to come. Okay, so let me give you one broad area, and I'm not, I, I would love to talk about this mostly, but I'm not going to, because this is the case where I think Adam and I actually probably come to some agreement, but with some further questions and interesting modifications. So, so on folk psychology, I'm not, for the longest time, there's two things I've been pushing the idea um, that both psychology is probably enculturated by means of a narrative. It's not it's a practice. It's not a theory. I've been a headliner on that kind of view, which fits perfectly. If I'm right about all those things, the idea that it's a kind of uh, a game that we learn with very specific rules and we learn how to make these attributions under certain conditions, it fits perfectly the model, right? I don't have to think that there are actually causal structures for the longest time in my career, I tried to defend some form of non-reductive data so only in the non-honest position positions. I like the idea of being realist about it, but lately I think that's not helpful. Uh, I've actually changed my mind on it, and I've been much more inclined to mind-shaping views of the sort that have been presented by uh, particularly uh, Victoria McGeever, right? So her line, as you can see here, is essentially this. The reigning view that FP is best understood as a proto-scientific theory has blinded us to other possibilities. I, along with Sean Gallagher and many others, have long argued against thinking of folk psychology as any kind of theory. So we're already in the same page. The big second move, though, is this. We overlook the way folk psychology operates as a regulative practice. So here, if we think of it as a set of enculturated practices that we learn, we learn a particular game. It's like a make-believe game, a master of the, of the, what I used to talk about, the forms and norms of folk psychology. You know how to make the attributions. You don't have to buy. You, you, can, you can go back this ontologically light. You can be a, a folk psychological practitioner without really, and this is the point I was going to make, that really committing strongly to causal 
told for anything of the kind. So you might even take it even lighter and say, I commit to the paramechanical. I could just be like, well, no, I know what it is to say, under what conditions I say somebody has beliefs, desires, and it gets me around. So I'm going to take it that that's actually a case where you have the useful, it's metaphorical, it's fine, it's very useful, it does good service. So this is the Thomas the Tank version. Okay. And since I don't disagree, and I've written on this very recently, since I don't agree, I think that's a really great way to think maybe and develop and refine our understanding of folk psychology in that direction. So that's a, a big score, I think, for Adam. Then there's this, cult of science, the whole shebang. So that's the extraordinary, that's not the everyday, this is the, and the admissions of cult science, I'm not so sure that fictionalism does so well here. But I think that the basic premise is absolutely right. So here's another nod to, I think, what the word, why the word is so important. So if I'm going to try and main, main get this onto the table, if this is right, then I think that the general mind is metaphor approach is probably right here too. But the, the lesson is not everything's great, it's all useful. It's that we have to rethink what's going on because we now know it's a metaphor. Now, I won't have time to go into any of these in any depth. I've been making heavy weather a bunch of challenges to traditional cognitive science on two particular challenges that relate, actually the core of them really relate to the notion of information and how you got from that to some of the standard apparatus in cognitive science. And I call these, if you know anything about the stuff I've done, you might know about the hard problem of content. It's not the same as the hard problem of consciousness. And I coined it deliberately to, to emphasize how difficult it is, but it's not a metaphysical problem in the same way Chalmers is, it's just a frustrating problem about how to naturalize content, but it's actually an analysis rooted in the fact that if you start, as you might, with information, and if information is taken to be nothing more than Shannon-esque style, or even better, more basically, uh, uh, co-variation, just simple co-variation, we don't have a story about how do we get to content. Even if we try to add the usual things, causation, or more likely, more promising biological function. I think in you, in the close inspection of those accounts, you don't get what you need to, to, to get to semantic content the way that people had hoped. And a lot of people, that's an ongoing debate, a lot of people deflating the notion, a lot of people defending it, that's been a serious challenge. On the principle that the starting point would be you had to add something to co-variation because co-variation isn't any kind of content. So even things like informational content is a misnomer, which is, is a, something that Dredsky would have talked about, but it's, it's not right unless you're presupposing it's already got properties that it doesn't have. That's a kind of hardcore challenge. That goes alongside with people don't know this, but it's in the same book. What we talked about is the information processing challenge, which is the very idea that information could be processed. The very idea, because information, if it's covariation, is a relation isn't the kind of thing that you can pick up, store, process. All those, all that language is technically nonsense if this is right. And so there's challenges sat around. What is the target there? Well, let's just look. This is the opening lines of uh, knowledge and the flow of information. Kretsky tells us in the beginning there was information. Great opening line. Um, kind of resonant with something else, but anyway. Uh, <laughs> The word came later. Information, though not meaning, is an objective commodity. But stuff isn't in here it's because I'm worried. Um, something whose generation, transmission, and reception do not require in any way presuppose interpretive processes. Meaning and the constellation of mental attitudes that exhibit it are manufactured products. The raw materials of information. That is the basis for explanatory naturalism, philosophical attempt to kind of ground the um, foundations of cold sci in a completely um, uh, explanatorily robust basis. And things have not gone too well. And when, of course, um, they do that without what, what, what I used to talk about, borrowing from Mike Wheeler, um, abiding by, and this seems to be especially um, pertinent given where we are in Exeter, abiding by the muddle constraint of not using their wands to fix this, right? They actually have to. Um, appeal to a notion of information that's scientifically respectable. That notion invariably, and it is here in Chicago, but you find it, Dretsky, Millikan, all of them, they're appealing to covariation, not by accident. Um, the relevant notion of information, therefore, at stake in information semantics is the notion involved in many areas of investigation, 
you know, those care varying properties that we know about. Okay, so um, one way you could play this game is you could introduce a new one, but you have the risk of it not being widespread, new notion of information that is. But if you don't, then you're stuck because it doesn't seem possible to square these uh, properties that it has with what you want to go on to say. Okay. And here again, this is the kind of thing, just to give it to you, when people talk about this, they tend to, when they're pushed to the wall, they will actually go and, and be very minimal about what they mean. So here we have Andy Clark, uh, in a more recent example, I'll give you countless examples, the time doesn't permit. But the term information here is used simply as a description of an energy transfer. It's not quite how we, that's not quite right, but anyway, leave that for now. Talk of information anyway, this says, must also be cashed out in terms of energies impinging on sensory uh, perceptives, in other words. Even that, I think, isn't quite right, but here's the thought. Information talk thus used, even if it was merely covariance, this would be the same, makes no assumptions concerning what the information is about. So covariation is a symmetrical relationship, right? It doesn't, it's not the kind of thing that you can talk about about this one way or the other, unless you can talk about both ways. And, and then, of course, you don't have the sufficient features, and that's been the problem. To talk about about this, you're just talking about a covariant relation. If you stick with that, technically. So what does that mean? Well, here's a modification of what Andy said. It's closer to it if we're if we're playing strict technical rules, or as Sean Connery says in Goldfinger, strict rules of golf, right? So uh, quote, information talk thus can make uh, no assumptions that information is about anything. Like strict. So it's not like we can help ourselves be about this notion there, or we have to actually be harder on ourselves. We're not yet at that stage. And so this is, I think, important. Um, what does that mean? Come back to the point I was emphasizing. It means that you can say things like this without problem, not metaphorically. Cognizers make information sensitive responses when engaging with environmental uh, offerings, or even, by the way, it could also be those environmental offerings can be part of the organism itself, in interior to the organism. So it can be parts of the organism that they're sensitive to, but you can't talk about them picking it up transforming it in all the usual metaphors. Why? Well, uh, this is a principle. Covariation isn't any kind of commodity, really. That's a metaphor. That's just a way of talking. It's not something that we can even make sense of, really. So you want to say brains and other systems don't actually traffic in India. When you're pinned down uh, by the IRS, the theoretical IRS, they say, no, I don't, they don't really pick up and process or store information or information content, but, but and information isn't really any kind of content, so it's not really content. But information, that kind of thing, you know, we're not really saying that's what's going on. It would be the right answer, I suppose. But that just puts pay to a lot of the metaphors, like the storehouse metaphor of memory, or the idea that brains store information, and the things that are in every article that I read ever about everything about the mind. So it's like, well, what is going on here? So this is not ordinary make-believe game in everyday life. This is the game of cognitive science played out using a bunch of metaphors that people can discharge. Um, so that worries me. Like I said, you could go with the interactive um, sensitivity information and that will get you a long way. Really interesting point, and I'm not going to dwell on this here, but when we get down to the seriousness of this about a lot of the debates, people are moving in the direction of saying, well, look, we're just talking about statistical regularities and so boundaries of mind and all that talk, that's nonsense. When you really understand that the statistical regularities of interest can be across different points and you might take different interests depending on what your explanatory game is, right? So sometimes those are in the environment of the system or across the, the organism, the environment, sometimes they're just internal. Some, you know, they can be in lots of different spots depending on what you're doing. Um, the boundaries of cognitive systems are nested in multiple and that with respect to the study of cognition has no fixed or essential boundaries. Right? So the whole boundary question is a bit of a nonsense driven by a certain way of talking. On some occasions, privileging the brain will be required to explain phenomena under consideration, sure, because this is where the things land, but not always and not in a fixed way. So that's where a lot of current debate is in around this, which, by the way, is consistent with just going with informational sensitivities and actually just marking those out in terms of formula and equations. Right? You don't have to, you can measure it, you can do all the things you're doing, you don't have to take it seriously. Why so serious? Okay. So let me dig into the pernicious metaphor point, case in point, very quickly. Just going to give one very famous one, which is memory, right? Place cells and rats. Like this kind of thing. Oh, this, this doesn't show up. Okay. Doesn't show up on the Zoom. You're right. 
So, or, or, I'm, or I've just blinded everyone on Zoom, sorry. Um, so, um, the play cells and rats picture is that you literally have pictures of the maze. I love this with the rat imagining themselves in the maze themselves, right? The way that they draw it. So, what are you imagining in these cases? Of course, what you do find is the systematic correlations between these things. That's not to be denied. But what are you picturing is going on, right? So then you go ahead and you picture a inner world of representation that causally, you know, track those things. You've now done a kind of story version of what's happening alongside the actual scientific material. What, what am I on about here? Let's give it. Let's give a concrete example, not about rats, but recent discussion of humans. I just want to look again. Stuff in green is, I think, perfectly interesting kind of uh, theoretical hypotheses. Stuff in pink, which you're about to see, I think, is the overlaid story. So humans possess a single neurocognitive system for the purposes of constructive episodic simulation. There's a recent paper on philosophy memory. So fun stuff. I'll get that later if you wanted to. Here we go. The systemation system includes information acquired from past events that is stored in the memory system and various simulative processes that act on this stored information. Information storage in the CES system is organized so to facilitate constructive process. That is to say, um, information from particular past events is stored in a distributed manner. This is a bad way of storing stuff, by the way, just in terms of reliability, but you probably know that. Um, that allows and it even encourages flexible recombination of event details across simulations. It's not wholly that's why we're bad at remembering things well about precise events. It's a bit of a mess given the storehouse conditions. So how it works in simulations, the CES constructs representations by flexibly retrieving and recombining the event in information in, the, in its memory system. So all that in pink is worrying if we go back to information as the commodity picture, right? And trying to make sense of well, what, what are we talking about here? And how does little bits of information that don't already have any kind of content construct content for how, you know, how does this all work? There's a lot going on here that um, we need more explaining. Now, I could take you into all that in more detail, I'm not going to, but these suggestions have been, you know, um, developed partly in response to the challenges to representationalism. So people have moved away from the content laden versions to an inflationally sparse picture. So tra basic trace minimalism has become memory trace minimalism is the idea that episodic remembering is to be understood as prediction about one's past experience based on sparse hippocampal information combined with knowledge of learned statistical regularity. So now we're even more technically telling us that it doesn't have the properties that would have that would give it content. So we strip it down even more to make it more technically correct. But the, the result of this is it gets harder to figure out how to connect that picture together. Um, so basically, if you want to read more about this, I've got we're responding to this in the recent current controversies about the philosophy of memory. But we get to the point where you want you, this is the question that you've got to keep if you really press it, like how do I make sense of those metaphors given what you told me, given what you've also told me is the nature of the cognitive uh, properties in question, right? I can't, how do I put all that together in a meaningful way? Now that would take us too long. But that is a challenge that I want to make. This is exactly where I think um, the problems arise because the metaphors don't turn out to be particularly helpful here. They, they are not like the other case. Let me let me put a little salt into this wound before I finish. Um, so here's Sarah Robbins. Uh, what drives this is much more an intuitive. It's not the science. It's not the technical. It's not that. It's a picture that we have about how memory works. And you kind of see it because you only get that little paragraph as the description of what's going on, and then you get this kind of as the justification. It's sort of a philosophical must. She, and this, I think, is really, it's not particularly Sarah in question, but anyone, I think, when they think about it, gets pulled into a certain pictured way of thinking about the scenario. If I want to think both, if I want to think about what I might be doing in this time of year, a few years in the future, my thoughts about that possible future will likely be derived from my detailed knowledge of how events in my life particularly during this time of year, have gone, updated so as to reflect how they might be combined and reconfigured in the future. So if I want to know what's happening in autumn at this time of the year, I might you know, have to reflect and pull together somehow or another recordings or stored information about past autumns, whatever. This is the important part, the next bit. 
In fact, it's unclear what the alternative hypothesis would be. Always a worry for me when there's no possibility of imagining an alternative hypothesis, right? So um, where would the components of our thoughts about events come from if not past event information? So you get hooked into the picture that that's the only way to make sense of this. And I'll use the language of making sense or you know, even you might say explaining it, but we're nowhere near explanation here if we don't, if we can't ground it. How would you even imagine it? And the point is we can't imagine it any other way. So I've been coined many years ago this term, it's very close to Dennett used to say, but I coined the term inference from lack of imagination, right? Which I think is not the best move in, but philosophers do it a lot. Um, I'll give you an example. So we're, in, I think, in here in a case of a gripping picture that we can't even get out of, and that's what makes it pernicious. Not just that it doesn't add, it doesn't tack into the technical, but we also can't get away from it somehow. We're trapped inside this way of thinking. Here's an example from Andy Clark. He says at one point in his work, why not simply ditch talk of inner models and inner representations and stay on the true path of an activist virtue? Uh, why not? Indeed. And he gives his reason. Um, and this, I think, is very salient for our purposes. But could we have told our story, and it is, I think, a story, in entirely non-representationalist terms, without invoking the concept of hierarchical probabilistic generative model at all? His answer is this. As things stand, I simply don't see how that's achieved. I can't imagine it. The same move, and it happens a lot in philosophy, is I can't imagine it any other way. So I'm used to playing in this particular pretend game. We know the rules of it. We can't tack it out. I can't discharge the metaphors, but I'm just used to sticking to this. And, and we're running a lot of the foundations of public science on. I'm going to rush to the end. Where are we getting this stuff? This is another point, I think, in Adam's work, really important. It's from the material culture, including philosophy itself. Right? Some of this stuff are older ideas that philosophy has introduced into the mix at certain points, probably older ideas that it's borrowed from too, right? So there's a history, a long history of other stuff. One great moment, I think, is, is uh, back in the early modern period, not just Descartes, but I think more perniciously, um, the empiricists have a lot to answer for, for, for having given us this division between primary and secondary bodies and the whole idea of sense data, but more importantly, the idea that you furnish a mind, that a mind is a place that's filled up with stuff. That's the big problem. That's the bigger problem, not in the next world, but in this very world, right? So you don't have to go to the Cartesian stuff to find this problem emerging. Just look, popular stuff re replays this back at us. I know maybe people don't read all this, but here you go. It's out there all the time. I think this is quite extraordinary. 2020, uh, one of the best-selling books on the brain, The Seven and a Half Lessons, quote, talks about compressing begins with small neurons that carry sense data from your eyes, ears, and other sense organs. If you're more up-to-date and know that sense data is a naughty thing to talk about, you'll insert, instead of sense data, information in there, and information that gets carted around like a commodity, just like sense data was. It's the same structural maneuver. I think this is funny. The guy who told you the same paper that told you there are no inner, no definitive essential boundaries for the mind and the brain is not a special membrane, all the rest of it. When they draw the photo pictures for the thing, they can't help but stick a brain on there at the same time. And I don't think this is accidental, right? This is the picture. It's the idea that that's where the storehouse, that's where the action is. Even when you're denying this in a paper, every single one of these pictures is of a brain. Uh, in the story. So this is how it also feeds into the popular imagination and also just keeps repeating on us. Um, so mm, tell it to that bird that it's just a metaphor not to worry. I think we should be worried. I know I come from Australia and I'm supposed to have, you know, it's no worries, but I'm also from New York, which is nothing but worries, right? <laughs> so I, I feel the inner conflict in my soul the way Walt Whitman talks about it. Yeah, so that's, I think, let's be worried. I think the New Yorker wins out in this case. Um, uh, just coming in there, I think there's cool work that's been done, and this is one last thing to applaud Adam for. Cool work that has been done on this before. Um, Eugen Fischer did some stuff on um, what he called picture-driven thinking, which, quote, leads to conclusions that the thinkers who make them are prone to find intuitive so once you've got the, and that's why a lot of philosophy, once you've got that going, it just seems impossible to imagine in any other way. It's an intuition, 
but also there's a lot of interesting work to show why we should be very suspect of intuitions in philosophy, and I'm on the side of the skeptics there too. I think that's not to say it always has to go wrong, I'm not saying that, but we have reason to think and think and think twice and be very, very careful about using intuitions as a basis for motivating argument. Um, I think this is where what I call must be thinking takes over. Must be thinking is where it must be the case. And that's not even in tune with the scientific approaches that people adopt on the whole, right? We, we have to, it has to be the case. It can't be any other way because I can't imagine it. And that fits with this. Quote, once picture-driven reasoning has led us to a philosophical conception, belief bias effects may have us read this conception into ordinary talk. And now I circle back to your point, right? Ordinary everyday talk, because we're basically stuck in the picture. And this becomes just reiterated and, and forced into our way of thinking. Even if it wasn't originally commonsensical, it becomes irresistibly, it seems like it has to be the case. And it, it's not that we think that it's sourced from common sense, we just think there's no other way to think about these topics at all. We just couldn't think about them any other way. That's dangerous. So here's another point of connection. I've worked on what I just moved from not just folk psychology, but what I call folk philosophy. And I talked about that in a 2020 paper in the Philosopher's Magazine. But the very idea was that our material culture all around us is ambient with philosophical ideas, it's bouncing with them, and they're replaying on us all the time. So Locke is in every Saturday morning cartoon as well when there's brain transference and all the rest going on and so we get hit from this from many many different angles that we think aren't very serious and yet they play up and, and constrain our imaginations in all sorts of important ways so i think interesting work is to trace out those ideas and the history of ideas and actually get a kind of genealogy there um, and i've started to do a little bit of work like that recently and i'll probably do a little bit more in a paper for the distributed cognition of the um, project up in edinburgh uh, right now, I'm working on a paper to kind of make this point about how dangerous the early modern ideas have been to our current thinking and how much pressure they still put on it. So I think this is part of what um, we have from Adam's uh, clarion call that we sort of should actually do archaeology, cognitive archaeology, and actually figuring out what are the pressures on our current thinking that make us use pernicious metaphors in cognitive science. And I think that's one of the big and many valuable points that Adam's work can perhaps launch work in that direction. So thank you. So I'm, I'm really grateful to, to Dan for those um, comments. And I think um, I, I think there is a, a lot of a, agreement between us, as he says. Um, I think, I mean, I can remember I was saying to Dan last night that back in uh, 2014, I was at a conference in, in Kingston in, in London, Jamaica. And um, uh, and I can remember giving a, a, a talk where at that time I was borrowing a lot of the extent of my literature and, and um, uh, trying to apply it to um, questions of positive science. And you were very encouraging that said something like maybe you want to just forget the inner representation and stuff. And at the time, uh, I couldn't quite see how to do that. And it took a while. And I guess the take home message I'm, I'm, I'm getting is that um, I still haven't ditched it quite as much as I, I should, or I've been a little bit too, um, uh, uh, too accommodating or. or uh, at that talk. And I think, I mean, I, I completely agree. I'm, I'm focusing on folk psychology in, in the book, and, and I do think that talk is very, it's very useful there. Um, and I entirely agree with you in corpus of science. It's it's um, it's an open question whether those metaphors are religious or not. But I agree. Um, of course, um, one of the things I'm trying to do in the book is to show that the folk don't take the talk too seriously, and I, I take it that won't buy lots of evidence of cognitive science. So this will, to use the terminology, this will have to be a, a revolutionary fictionism, as, it, as it's called, and if applied to lots of areas of cognitive science, not a hermeneutic one. In other words, it will have to be a proposal on how to reform certain modes of discourse rather than an attempt to interpret them. And there is an open question about whether that's that's useful or, or not. Mm -hmm. I guess, um, I mean, we, we've talked about this before, and I, I suppose that um, I'm, I'm very much, uh, I'm sensitive to your concern about the kind of Tina, you know, there is no alternative um, move that's, that, that often uh, comes up. Um, I suppose that where I'm resistant is just the thinking of my work in philosophy of science on, on models, just thinking of one of the main lessons from thinkers on models right back to Mary Hesse and Nancy Cartwright and Longhiri and so on is to say that 
often the best we can do is a metaphor, a model, um, a, a, a representation that we realize is, is misleading in all, in all sorts of, of ways. And we have no, very often have no better access uh, to the phenomena than, than that. Um, but of course, that doesn't open the door to every metaphor being, being, being useful. And I think one of the things I see as a, a question here that is still very much needs to be addressed, despite all the work that's been done on models and representations, is um, once you go away from thinking that what matters is simply truth or falsity, to thinking what matters is a much more subtle, graded notion of how apt these representations are, how useful can they be in various domains, you end up uh, opening up a, a, a very complicated set of questions to which the answer may well be case by case. And I realize that's a bit of a get out. Um, but, uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, thanks. Uh, no, I, I appreciate the fact that you um, it, and I get it very much. Two things to say. I think what's cool about the metaphor idea is that it would explain why people can't see an alternative. Like you, 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 you pulled into a game in a way of talking framework style. Like it's just the basis for how the way you're talking about the mind. So even in the cold side case, so certainly cold psychology case, everyday case, you can think that people who don't, um, and I agree with that completely, that you don't have to, I don't think the folk are particularly hyper committed to too much. That would be, I, I, I'm inclined to the folk light thing. They know how to make the moves, but you know, and, and they might have certain tendencies, but those I think come from these other philosophical sources, right? Not from the practice of making attributions themselves. Right? So, you know how to make an attribution in belief society, then ask somebody in the street, like the father leaves in the head, they might say yes, they might say who knows what, right? They're very likely to if they start to reflect on it, but they might not even think this typically won't think that question means a lot to them at all. Like right? they just look at you puzzled, would be another move. So I think that's fine. In cold side, I think. I guess what I want to say is I wouldn't be too sane, but maybe I'm just too pessimistic in my old age, or actually in my young age. I think I had a just dose of David Hume or something like that in, in the bloodstream. But like I'm very skeptical all the way through that large swathes that rely take the whole of memory research or imagination. The whole thing that depends on mental representations having properties and things makes me anxious for the reasons I gave you as a as a so I'm giving you a case study in memory. You might say, well, maybe that's a problem with memory. Frankly, I think if memory shows itself to be problematic in this way, I think that's just going to extend across the board. Memory is one of the chief areas where um, if anyone ever tells me, and they do a lot, that you need mental representations, the standard things that used to be perception, people stop doing that for a while because they think they actually it's getting along pretty well without mental representations, at least some of the theorizing. But memory, everyone tells me, and imagination are places where you can't do without mental representations. And I think that's not true. And so then I think you're right, over time, it's, it's over a long period of time, people begin to shift the, the imaginative possibilities because we develop alternative accounts that don't require it. And that's, of course, how science works anyway, but that's all part of it, right? So sure, you need to use something, but you don't need to get stuck in defending it I think it gets worried when scientists or alleged scientific work gets defended by philosophical intuition. But that becomes a bit of a worry, it seems like. If we're saying we have to accept this, if we also then say something else, and I'll stop, if you say that there's successes in quantum science, there's also the failures, but you also have to ask what, what are the what are the lasting successes? People used to talk about Mars theory of vision as a great success, except the problem with that is. Now, most people will tell you that Mars theory vision doesn't hold up with the new thinking about perception as well. They also think it's one of the great things that we've gotten beyond. So I think, you know, it's not a steady state, stable place where we have just one set of answers. So it's, it's I think it's much more raucous. Um, so yes, if we get into it, we might come to see that the metaphor stuff gives us a new way of thinking. Anyway, I'll have something to Thank you very much for the fabulous and fantastic presentations. Obviously, we're now opening up.